Super Speedway, 1970. The old quarter mile stretched out to a mile, one and a half, two and a half miles of special compound concretes. Promoters dreamed of long, steep banked ovals. Detroit provided the super stock cars. The drivers came along for the ride, all drawn into an upward spiral of speed, size, and money. Progress. Plymouths, Fords, Mercury's, Dodges are taken straight from the dealer's showroom and then specially engineered, tuned and balanced with spacecraft precision to one specification. Maximum safety at maximum speed. The cost is in the millions. No driver could afford it. Who pays it? <laughs> small American car restoration business in Pakenham called Southern Customs. I should tell you that uh, the reason I'm a rev head, as we call it, or as the Americans call it, a gear head, is that uh, my father was in the automotive industry when I was growing up and of course uh, I remember fondly how uh, he worked for General Motors and used to go to the US when I was in my formative early pre-teen years and used to bring back all the uh, memorabilia and literature from the States and 6.9 Camaro colour brochures, you know, Chevelles and stuff, and I was pretty much hooked by that. The Plymouth Superbirds were built uh, in a limited run soon after what was called a Dodge Daytona, which was a run of 50, uh, 500 cars rather. There was uh, less than 2,000 Superbirds built, and they were specifically built to homologate for NASCAR racing in the US. They were only built for one year because uh, once they creamed uh, and won all the races, uh, the NASCAR board uh, powers that be banned them, uh, essentially said if you want to run the aero cars as they're called, you can run a 5 litre. Well of course compared to running a uh, 7.5 litre Hemi versus a 5 litre, it's all about cubes in the US, they, uh, they bit the bullet and got away, did away with the wings and so forth. So, so they're a special build that was designed in wind tunnels to, uh, to compete on the high speed loop circuits or the bank circuits in the US. Uh, they were designed, as I mentioned, in a, in a, a wind tunnel uh, and they used the aerodynamic aids to allow them to push past the 180 mile an hour mark, which is where the uh, cars at the time were limited by their physical design of pushing against the air. Of course, the aero aids allowed them to break the 200 mile an hour mark. And, um, uh, that makes them fairly special. I was only watching NASCAR the other day, watching a good old boy Marcus Ambrose, who they referred to as a Tasmanian by the way, not an Australian, I was a bit offended by that. Anyway, they're only doing 200 mile an hour now, 40 years later. So you're talking about you know, the Superbirds and the Do Daytonas being pretty special in their day to be able to consistently run as fast as they can now 40 years later. <laughs> Seventies with new, all original, new old stock parts, and you know what? I don't care that it's a clone because I can do this. Woo! All right. All right. Woo! Eighty mile an hour, like that. Mopar is all about. Thank you for coming. 
They got rid of them because the body governing NASCAR determined that they were too fast and therefore had a competitive advantage over everyone else and therefore said, OK, no more, uh, no more wings. So therefore General Motors and Ford were back on a level playing field. So that's sort of what the, what the demise of the, the Superbirds and the Daytonas was. And uh, what I understand, they uh, in the day were not very popular when they came out. They had to build X amount to brace them and qualify and homologate them. And uh, um, I've read stories where dealers were turning them back into basic road runners and uh, Super Bs, so they would turn them over because the noses and the wings were even then too outrageous for the outrageous Americans of the 70s, so, um, which is a surprise. So, uh, so they were quitting them at a cheap price to get rid of them, same time the uh, insurance crisis was going on the US, gas price was going through the roof and uh, uh, there was a big mental change from that youthful 60s muscle car to Econo boxes that became the 70s cars, you know, they really lost all of that, uh, all the things that were great, which is one of the reasons I enjoy them so much. They are uh, uh, never to be made again, you'll never see them again, you'll never see poor fuel economy like that again, you'll never see poor handling, poor brakes. But you'll never see styling like that either. And you know, some of the styling cues and the touches. So in, in many respects, they're time capsules that you'll never see again of a, a bygone era.